How would you define poverty? Take a second to come up with your answer. Is it a familiar term? The common person might say that the poverty is the lack of wealth or welfare, or homelessness or starvation. Yes, unfortunately, this definition of poverty is correct. Yet we are only skimming the surface of what pov- people in poverty experience in their lives. In these next few minutes, Olivia and I will go into depth about what exactly poverty means and how we should define and measure it. Based on our own approach, we believe that the capabilities approach and the global MPI are the best solutions. But first, let's take a step back. Can poverty be measured? The answer is complicated. For many decades, economists, statisticians, and officials in the United States have been creating certain measurement methods to gauge how many Americans are in poverty and what constitutes being in poverty. In the 1960s, an American economist named Molly Orshansky, in her research, discovered that, on average, the typical American household spent a third of their income on food. From this, she found that by multiplying a household's grocery bill by three, she was able to develop income thresholds, better known as the poverty line. This method was adopted by the U.S. and deemed the official poverty measure, or the OPM. However, the OPM was exceptionally black and white, not to mention outdated. Although the OPM adjusts for the size of the household, composition, relative family ages, and inflation, it is a bit misleading because of the attributes of poverty are different across time. And the OPM does not include non-cash benefits, nor is it internationally used. To add on, it only focuses on the income aspect of poverty, not all else that comes with the term. More on that later. Now, because researchers found the OPM to be too vague, the SPM was born, the Supplemental Poverty Measure. This, too, covers FCSU, food, clothing, shelter, and utilities, like the OPM, but it also accounts for cash income, food programs like SNAP, energy assistance, housing subsidies, FICA, and Social Security, and takes up the non-discretionary spending, including taxes, health care, community, and child care, because those are things people typically need to budget out money for. Additionally, the SPM also accounts for all people in a household and the geographic locations of families. The SPM also may be more familiar since it is the main source of poverty data in the news and media today. There are other benefits that come with using the SPM because by incorporating the assistance programs, we can see that programs help with lifting people out of poverty, while the OPM does not. For instance, the SPM has shown that Social Security is one of the most helpful anti-poverty programs, helping 26.5 million people get above the poverty threshold in 2020. Both the OPM and SPM are good for getting basic poverty measures, but is it really enough information to be able to fully measure and understand poverty? Of course not. Those measurements are only focusing on the financial part of poverty. Money might matter when it comes to the well-being of a person, but that's not all. Wealth is not just measured on financial status, but on non-materialistic free entities. We mean the holistics, happiness, success, quality of life, and many more. All these freedoms contribute to the well-being of a person. Because as American philosopher Martha Nussbaum put it, these Areas of freedom are so central that the removal makes a life not worthy of human dignity. Those measurements also do not portray the many faces of poverty. In fact, the census bureau is is often misleading. When most people think of being below the poverty line, they think of those in extreme absolute poverty. In reality, poverty is an umbrella term that covers all forms of deprivation. For not being able to cover the bills, for instance, to being homeless. To further this point, let us look at an argument of what poverty in the United States, at least in the early 2000s, looked like. Our arguer, Robert Rector, is a Senate Senior Research Fellow for the Heritage Foundation, analyzed various pieces of data on what poverty looks like in the U.S. in his articles and made a case that poverty is not what the media paints it to be. But in many cases, those impoverished households do have amenities. For instance, 84% of those below the poverty threshold have AC, 79% had TV, and 68% had a personal computer. 
Rector claimed that a typical family in poverty was comfortable and had commodities, which is very different from the images of starving children in shacks on the television screen. His argument is a strong one, and the statistics he provides are all factual, but what Rector fails to acknowledge is the behind the scenes of these statistics. Numbers only so sh show so much. Could these people be making ends meet or have a low but secure in income? Yes, but many could be struggling to pay the bills to afford those amenities. There is no information on the quality of the amenities, or if the appliances that came with the rented house they live in, or the quality of the running water, or the nutritional value of the food that is on the table. The thing with poverty is it is so specific, generalizations are made all the time, and those in poverty are often overlooked. Earlier, we mentioned the OPM and SPM only focuses on the income aspect of poverty, and clearly that is not enough. So what is the solution? There, re there really is no perfect method, but the best way we have found to measure poverty is to go personal. To look at the effects of the individual, family, or specific geographic or demographic populations, and what factors lead to them being considered poor or in the situation they are in. To do this, we recommend the capabilities approach, accompanied by what we think is the most accurate and dependable index tool, the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index. With these two methods, we firmly believe that poverty can be properly measured by getting into the details and respecting the individual by not categorizing them as vaguely as the other measurements. First of all, what is the capabilities approach? As for definitions, Amartya Sen and Martha Nesbaum, two economists and philosophers that have specialized in the cap capabilities approach, define a capability as a way to represent the alternative combinations of things a person is able to do or be, as various functionings they can achieve. As for a functioning, these represent parts of the, of the state of a person, the varying things that they manage to do or to be in a leading life. When someone then has a functioning failure, someone might look into and see why there is a failure, and if it is a choice or not. Here's an analogy that Sin and Nesbaum used. The difference between fasting and starving. In both situations, the faster and the starving person are not eating, but the faster chooses not to eat while the starving person does not have the choice to eat. In this case, we would not provide food for the fasting person because that, that would be disrespectful to their lifestyle and provide food to the starving person to help them if they choose to accept the help. But by focusing on the cap capabilities of a person instead of the functionings, like the source of the food, we can avoid disrespecting anyone's capabilities. These instances of capability failures can be very specific, but they need to be recognized and analyzed at this level to properly understand how to handle the situation to benefit the person the most. Nussbaum offers a list of 10 central capabilities that should be available to all people, which includes life, bodily health, senses, imagination, and thought, emotions, practical reason, control of one's political and material environment, and more. She offers these central capabilities as markers for well-being because she believes that our focus should be on the protection of these freedoms, which are central to our lives, and their removal makes life not worthy of human dignity. People care about wealth, yes, but there is so much more in life that is enjoyable that all people should have the luxury to. Everyone deserves these freedoms. With these capabilities, people can excel to the highest levels of achievement, and that may be different for everyone, at least the, for those who are in total deprivation, by having these capabilities, they feel that they can be a part of their community and be able to appear in public without shame and so on. Oftentimes, people feel ashamed because of their socioeconomic status, but if we use these approaches to seek out their specific areas of struggling, we can help them feel more comfortable and included. As for a more traditional form of poverty measurement, we have the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index. The Global MPI complements traditional monetary measures with acute deprivations in these three dimensions, health, education, and living standards, instead of just assessing the income of a household, then breaking it down into 10 smaller subsets. This gives economists the ability to look at poverty at the individual level. If a person is deprived in a third of more than 10 indicators, they are considered poor. The Global MPI also permits comparisons as broad or specific as desired. This is also the best index for assessing people's situations, for it can help design policies more effectively to target the problematic areas.